We're continuing our brief break from our series in First King, our Second Kings. God willing, we'll resume that next Lord's Day evening. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the uh, the book of First Peter, chapter four, verses one through eleven, will be our focus tonight. First Peter, chapter four, beginning with verse one. I remind you that this is the word of the living God. So let us give our attention to its reading. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that has passed suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received the gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything... God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved, what do you picture in your mind when you hear the call, arm yourselves for the end is near? Perhaps a militia group that is hiding out from the civil government, or maybe a man on the street corner with a sandwich board sign declaring that the end is coming soon. Well, Peter is offering us neither of those images. What he has to say is not dependent upon the ups and downs of the world. Peter knows two things that are important for believers in this life. The first is that Christians are engaged in a spiritual battle. Even if no one bothers us or persecutes us, the enemy of our soul, that is Satan, is seeking to make war with us. We know this from Scripture itself. Revelation 12 details for us how Satan was cast down by Christ. He was cast down and defeated, but not completely destroyed. Not yet. He is wounded, dying, but he goes off in that chapter to make war with the saints, to make war with Christ's people. The second truth that Peter is teaching here is related. That everything has been accomplished in redemption, redemptive history. Christ has won and now sits enthroned in heaven waiting for that last day. Well, as we study this passage this evening, it is my hope that we'll understand more of what Peter is saying, both in, in how it lines up with the rest of Scripture and what it calls us to in this life. So the first point that we want to consider is Peter's words in verses 1 to 6. Arm yourself for battle. As we begin our study, we see that Peter returns to a familiar theme that he goes through throughout 1 Peter. We've been looking at 1 Peter in our Monday night Bible studies over these past weeks and months. And a familiar theme that Peter returns to over and over again is the suffering Christ. He says, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh. Peter has used Christ's sufferings throughout this epistle for various reasons. He uses it as a reminder of our salvation. We see this in 1 Peter 2 and verse 24 when he says that he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Christ's suffering is central in our understanding of our redemption. He has also referred to Christ's sufferings as an explanation of believers' own sufferings. In chapter 2, verses 20 and 21, Peter writes, For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. 
He also uses it, uses it as a way of comforting believers. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 14, Peter writes, But even if you, you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear, nor be troubled. Lastly, we see Peter using the theme of suffering as an encouragement to believers that he's writing to, these, these, these who have been run out of their homes, the diaspora. Christ has suffered for us, and so he says in chapter 2 and verse 10, you who were once not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Because Christ's suffering is so important, Peter now moves to say that we don't just acknowledge it as, as foundational to all that we have, but we must embrace the suffering. This is what he gets at when he writes, since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Here he focuses our attention on the mind of Christ. His attitude towards suffering becomes what we must embrace. The Greek word that we have translated as arm yourselves was used of a Greek soldier putting on his biggest pieces of armor, taking up his most powerful weapons. Like the Apostle Paul elsewhere, Peter wants us to be armed with everything that we need for the battle that is before us. And yet even here we are reminded of what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. What is this mind of Christ or the way of thinking with which we are to arm ourselves that Peter is talking about? We can consider Christ's thinking when it came to honoring his heavenly Father. Remember that for eternity past, Jesus is equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He takes on human flesh to honor his Father. Although it would cost him his earthly life, he honored his Father by being obedient no matter the cost. There are two primary illustrations of this given to us in Scripture. The first is the incarnation itself. Jesus was eternally God, and yet we read in Philippians 2, He made Himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. But the second illustration is that moment in Gethsemane where it seems, by all appearances, that Christ is struggling in His own thinking. We considered that this morning as we looked at Psalm 73, as Jesus cries out, if there is another way for salvation to be found, then, then make that happen. And not as I will. Jesus knew what was coming in the cross. He knew of the wrath that would be poured out upon Him, but He honored His Father submitting Himself to His will. This is the way of thinking that we need to arm ourselves with, Peter says. Peter calls us to be obedient to God's revealed will regardless of what it might cost us, praying that God's will would be done even as it might lead us into struggle. Now all of this is going to look very different for each one of us, and yet there are many things that we all commonly face, temptations and struggles in this life. But the more familiar we are with God's holiness, as found in His law, the more we are able to have this way of thinking. The more that we think of Christ, the more we are able to arm ourselves with the way that He thought. We can think of Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3, as, as, as a parallel kind of encouragement. There we read that, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of, God, of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Christ has won the victory for us. And so, in arming ourselves with his way of thinking, we are merely taking our places in the battle that has been won but still goes on. Looking further at our passage, how are we to interpret Peter's next statement? He says, For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Surely Peter cannot be saying that simply suffering itself leads to sinlessness. I know, and you probably know as well, of Christians who suffer in this life, and it doesn't lead to a state of ceasing from sin. 
In fact, suffering can expose sin as we find ourselves bitter against God, questioning His love for us, or wondering about His sovereign will. Suffering does not automatically lead to less sin. Many of the medieval monks believed that suffering led Christians to at least focus less on sin. And while that can be true, if we have the mind of Christ, it is not automatic. And focusing less on sin certainly does not do justice to Peter's words here that they have ceased from sin. No, I believe that Peter is speaking much the same way that the Apostle Paul does in Romans chapter 6. There, the Apostle Paul speaks about how, how we are no longer slaves to sin. For believers, for you and me, there has been a, a, a break with sin. We are dead to sin and now alive to Christ in the Spirit. In fact, I would argue that we can obey God's holy laws. We have the mind of Christ. Not perfectly, but we have His Spirit within us. And we have his law that has been written upon our hearts. And so we are able to stand against sin. This is the assumption of Scripture. This is the Old Testament promise that we find in Ezekiel and Jeremiah with regard to the New Covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8, we are told that, that Christ has instituted that New Covenant. The Apostle Paul urges believers to stand in the midst of spiritual warfare in Ephesians 6. Assuming then, the, the, the assumption there being that we are able to stand. Oh, it's not in ourselves, of course. Neither Paul nor Peter would think that we have the strength in ourselves to stand, but rather we stand united to our Savior, Jesus Christ. I found the words of John Calvin helpful in thinking through these verses. He writes that Peter sets forth what that thought or mind is with which Christ's death arms us even that the dominion of sin ought to be abolished in us so that God may reign in our life. When we become dead to the flesh, we have no more to do with sin, that it should reign in us and exercise its power in our life. And in fact, this makes this verse connect with, better with Peter's overall thought as he writes, the time has, is past, or the time that is past, suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. What Peter is saying here is that it's time to put away sin for the believers. Sin should not be something that we as believers play with. But we all know those areas where we tend to fall into temptation. Those sins that seem to beset us. Peter is telling us that we need to be serious about putting sin to death because Christ has put it to death ultimately on the cross. There is, in Peter's mind, in Paul's mind, in the mind of Scripture, there is a break in our lives with sin. The words of John Owen are both true and fitting in this context. In his work, The Mortification of Sin, he writes, Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Because you and I are in the midst of this battle, we must arm ourselves with the mind of Christ to fight against the sin that remains and the attacks from Satan that are sure to come. Peter's list here is not exhaustive. He talks of living in sensuality and passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. It's not an exhaustive list as though we can simply check them off and say that we are perfected because these are not temptations for us. These were struggles that those believers had. It was struggles that they had perhaps in their congregation or just in the, in, in, in the culture in which they lived. Make no mistake, when Peter says that for doing what the Gentiles do, he is, not, he is not creating or recreating, we should say, that divide between Jew and Gentile that we see in the Old Testament Scriptures. No, he is using the term Gentile as a catch-all for those who are outside of the church. The nations, we can say. The people around them. For even those churches to which Peter is writing had Gentile believers in them. These were struggles that those believers had. For us, it might be different, but the command remains, as does the warning in verse 4. He says, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Here, Peter is telling us that living according to God's word will not always put us in the best light in the world. 
connecting Peter's passage with our own context, we can think about how Christians are even today considered to be prudes because we don't adopt an everything-goes mentality toward sex. They're surprised that we hold to such outdated views as those found in the Bible. Thinking about Peter's warning here, we can even see how our own culture works. They're surprised, and it turns to slander as Christians are maligned. The word that Peter uses here is actually the word blasphemed. Christians are spoken against in a God-hating way because we will not approve of how the world lives. Peter tells us that we must be prepared for this. And how do we do that? We arm ourselves with the same thinking that Christ had as we willingly suffer for the sake of God. We do this because we know the truth. Judgment is coming. Peter goes on to say, but they will give an account, or they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Now note that he says he's ready to judge the living and the dead. We'll connect that with our next point. But he says they will give account. Unbelievers live the way that they do because they do not believe that they will ever be called to account for their actions. This life is all they care for, and so they do what they want, whatever feels good in the moment. Think again of Psalm 73 that we looked at this morning as, as the psalmist outlined all the ways in which unbelievers lived. And they seemed so comfortable, even prosperous, in their unbelief. But as Christians, we do not live this way. Peter reminds us that a day of judgment will come. This is both sobering and comforting. It is sobering because we know that this world will not go on indefinitely. One day, God will send His Son again, this time not humble and riding on a donkey, but riding on a war horse to come and bring judgment, as we read in Revelation chapter 19. But it's comforting because we know that the judge who will come has taken our sentence for us. Verse 6 elaborates on this and says, For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. The phrase, this is why, points us back to the coming judgment. Judgment is coming, and this is why the gospel was preached. This is why we can say that it continues to be preached. This is why Christ crucified, uh, uh, resurrected, and ascended into heaven remains the center point of our, uh, uh, of our understanding of how we are right with God. Now to understand why Peter writes this verse in the way that he does, we need to understand one of the pressing concerns of the first century church. There were many who believed that Christ was going to come before they passed away. That is, they believed in the imminent return of Christ, and by imminent, that is near, they believed immediate. But he did not return. He did not return during that first generation, and people died. And the question became, what happened to them? Peter explains here that they were judged in the flesh the way people are. That is, they died. For the curse of sin is death, and coming to faith in Christ does not do away with death. If the Lord does not come before the end of our lives, we will all face that great enemy of mankind. We will all face death. But Peter explains to us that though they have died, they still live in the spirit the way God does. That is, they have a spiritual existence while their bodies wait in the grave until the resurrection. As Paul says, through death, though death comes, it has no sting. It has no victory. Now this state between death and the resurrection is one of the mysteries that remains. But Peter is assuring them that those who have died having responded to the gospel, are alive with God. There is no soul sleep. There is no annihilation or destruction of the soul. The Westminster Shorter Catechism is helpful here in question 37 when it says, what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death? And the answer is, the souls of believers are, at their death, made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory and their bodies being still united to Christ to rest in their graves till the resurrection. Peter makes clear then that the way in which we are to, that the mind in which we are to have 
is one that flows, that understands the reality of suffering, the call of our lives to, to, to live godly lives, and the hope that we have as we wait for the resurrection. And maybe it is thinking of that reality of the resurrection that Peter turns to speak of the end of all things. And this is our second point, to live with the end of all things in mind. Peter writes that the end of all things is at hand. It's an absolute claim that has been interpreted in various ways throughout church history. For everyone who wants to believe that this is the year that Christ will return, and I suppose there's still some time left, this verse is cited as proof. Of course, the obvious problem with that is that Peter wrote this in the middle of the first century. If that was his intended purpose, that the end was at hand, that it was going to happen during that time, then he was clearly wrong. Even if Christ were to come, say, this year or next, we are still nearly 2,000 years past the time that Peter wrote these words. Other interpretations have included the possibility that Peter was referring to the end of each person's life, as in, the end is always near for each of us, or perhaps the end of Jerusalem, since he is writing so close to 70 AD when the temple was destroyed for the last time. Well, I think that both of those interpretations can be in line with Scripture. I don't know that that's what Peter is getting at here. I think the point he is making is more grand, is more sweeping. He sees all of history along the lines of redemption. When it comes to all that God has promised, everything is in place. All that is left is for Christ to return. In other words, everything else that God revealed and purposed to take place before that final event has all happened. There is no need of a prophecy watch to try to fit modern events into biblical prophecy. There is no need to try and understand, for instance, how the United States fits into the Bible when no such nation is named. There is nothing left except the end. In other words, the gospel goes on, as, as the gospel is proclaimed, and as the elect are called from all nations, there will come a time when there is a period put on the end of history. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church and the spread of the gospel truly were the final events. So we can clearly affirm that the end of all things is at hand. We are living in the last days, and have been since the time of the New Testament church. The, the, the great last act, the church age, had been going on for about 30 years when Peter wrote these words, and they've carried on for many, many more since then. But it doesn't make it any less true that the end of all things is near. This was the point of some of the parables that Jesus told in his own ministry, such as the one about the ten uh, bridesmaids. You probably remember it there in Matthew chapter 25. We read about how the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. If you recall the parable, five were foolish, taking no oil with them, and five were wise, taking flasks of oil for their lamps. And the parable continues. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you, and then Jesus closes with these words. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Peter heard that parable from Jesus himself. And he seems to be urging the church to remember that it is still true. This is something that the church in every generation needs to hear. Needs to be reminded of that the end of all things is at hand. Not in the sense that we ought to sell everything and give up all that we're doing. No, it's much more focused than that. Peter will focus our attention on what we ought to be doing because the end of all things is at hand. John Calvin reminded his congregation here, he says, Though the faithful hear that their happiness is elsewhere than in the world, 
Yet, as they think that they should live long, this false thought renders them careless and even slothful, so that they direct not their thoughts to the kingdom of God. Hence the apostle, that he might rouse them from the drowsiness of the flesh, reminds them that the end of all things was nigh, by which he intimates that we ought not to sit still in the world from which we must soon remove. And he goes on to say, It is then no wonder that the cares of this world overwhelm us and make us drowsy, if the view of present things dazzles our eyes. For we promise almost all of us an eternity to ourselves in this world. At least, the end never comes to our mind. Looking back at our text, Peter says, we must always live with the end in mind. This must dictate how we walk through our days. It must, it, it must be part and, and, and really the guiding reality as we form our plans for the future, living with the end in mind. But look how Peter directs in such a situation. He doesn't tell us to sell all our belongings and to go and wait on the top of a mountain somewhere as some of the Christians in that day had done. No, he gives us instructions that are quite ordinary. Therefore, he says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength of that God supplies. The end of all things is at hand. So we are to use our gifts to bless one another. We are to be self-controlled and sober-minded. The fact that the end of all things is at hand calls us to diligence, yes, but it is a diligence in the ordinary. Right in the middle of these instructions, Peter tells us that we are to love one another earnestly. That is, in a sincere and fervent way. It could even be translated to mean a zealous or enthusiastic way. Basically, what he is saying here is that we are to be zealous for one another, that is, other Christians in the body of Christ. Not only do we serve one another with the gifts that we have, but we love one another as best as we are able. And then he adds, since love covers a multitude of sins. Now, that's just an amazing observation on Peter's part. And it really is amazing on two levels. First is that it's connected to the gospel. When Adam and Eve sinned, they saw that they were naked, and so they hid. God covered their shame by offering the first sacrifice, that is, the first animal that was, that was killed. Through providing clothing, the death of the animal covered their shame in Genesis chapter 3. When we come to the Old Testament sacrifices in Exodus and Leviticus, we find that the idea of covering for sins is drawn on again. The blood that would be put on the mercy seat to cover the sins of God's people. In both cases, the motivation for God's action is love. He, he, his love for his people covered a multitude of sins by accepting the sacrifice. By drawing on this image, I believe Peter is reminding us of how we are all forgiven. Christ's death atones, covers our sins. Not one of us would stand in God's presence without condemnation if it were not for the covering death of Jesus. What Peter calls us here, calls us to here, is to extend that sin-covering love to one another. Not in the sense that, 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 that we atone for one another's sins, but rather our love for one another covers over the sins. That's the second part of the observation that I think is quite good here. Because people within the church will not always be lovable. We all have our sinful tendencies. And I know that some of them, might, within the church, there are those that will rub one another the wrong way. We are to love one another to the point that it covers over our offenses. But this isn't meant to say that church discipline is wrong or that we should live with everything that each of us does no matter what. There's a time for correction. There's a time for rebuke. There's a time even for excommunication. But the general rule for how we are to interact with one another is to love one another to the, to the point of overlooking some of those faults that might otherwise cause division. This is important for churches. We all have different personalities and we all struggle in different ways. 
if we simply take to pointing out one another's flaws every single time that we bother one another, we will bite, devour, and ultimately destroy one another. And there will be no encouragement among us. But at the same time, we also should not allow ourselves to be indifferent to one another. No, we must embrace one another in love, regardless of our flaws. Just as we are called to think, of Christ, think as Christ thought, so we are called to love as Christ loved. All of this holds together in these verses. For it is as we are armed with the mind of Christ that we are able to fulfill the commands that Peter gives. All of it, we see, has one end as Peter brings his exhortation to an end. In order that, every, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice what Peter is doing. Not only do we have the mind, are we called to have the mind of Christ and to live with the end in mind, but we're even to look beyond that end to the glory of God through Jesus Christ, to the one who has all glory and dominion over all. For Christ is reigning even now, and we wait for his reign to be made known to the world. So until then, we are to arm ourselves with the same way of thinking, we are to understand that the end of all things is at hand. As we move from one year into the next, we can give thanks for all the ways that God has blessed us, preserved us, and provided for us over this last year. But as we move forward, may we do so with a desire to love, to serve, to bless one another, to live with the end in mind that we might seek God's glory as our utmost motivation. For he is the one who is worthy of all glory.